want to shift gears a little bit to talking about working in restaurants because as I kind of shared before we turn the mics on there's there are a lot of sous chefs and line cooks and culinary school students that that listen to the show and so you lay out this really really interesting paradox quote when cooks complain of the monotony of their tasks chefs remind them that while they are they aspire to artistry they are for now skilled tradespeople who should take pride in perfection and pleasure in repetition then, when they complain about low wages, that they are not paid like electricians, plumbers, or any other skilled tradespeople, a chef will reverse course to remind them that they are artists and must suffer for their creative pursuits. End quote. How do you grapple with that? I mean, the way that I grappled with it was to get out of the industry and into another industry. Um, and now to try to have that conversation, both with diners and with workers. And it, it's always uh, difficult in my writing. I, I, I try to, two things I try to do when I'm writing, particularly when I either get writer's block or I just try to figure out what's the right way to say the thing I'm trying to say is one, I, I read out loud everything, you know, so it sounds kind of conversational. It's two is if I don't know how to say it, I always get up out of my chair and I go, what are you trying to say and who are you trying to say it to? And sometimes it's a real conflict because you know, no editor is writing for specifically uh, a type uh, of worker in a specific field, unless it's a trade magazine. In general, editors are going to say, this is for the general public. Don't make it too inside. But at the same time, I'm like, I do want to speak to the workers, people people like actually toiling away in restaurants uh, at such a variety of levels. Um, I, I mean, but again, there's all the different genres of restaurants, but in the chef driven restaurant. And when you speak with anyone in, in that field, they're like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. You don't have to elucidate any further. Um, that is a, maybe not uh, ubiquitous, but it is an incredibly common managerial style, right? As soon as people are like, oh man, we do the same thing every day. And they're like, hey man, an electrician doesn't complain about the doing the same thing every day. You got to do it precisely the same because it matters because if you do it wrong it could be an electrical fire and if we do something wrong somebody could get poisoned or even worse they could have a meal that wasn't perfect which is unthinkable and then as soon as you start you go like um it's uh as soon as you start going like but the people in that field like they get paid two or three times what i make so i'm not a skilled trade even though i'm recognized uh by you know the college of skilled trades as a skilled trade and I have my red seal, you know, then it comes back, uh, well, we're artists. Come on. I mean, if all you want is to make money, go somewhere else. Uh, I don't know where this mercenary attitude is coming from. Perhaps you don't have the passion to make it in this no kitchen. Worse. You know, everyone else here, everyone else here, they have the passion. You know, Steve over there, he came in two hours early. Not that I asked him to, not that I would ever ask him to. And if the labor board ever comes around investigating, I never asked anyone to do that. Everyone here comes in voluntarily two hours every day. But, you know, that's just kind of the sort of pimpology. And I think sometimes even unconsciously that a lot of chefs uh, exhibit as managers, I think, because that's what was done to them, because it's the it's the psychological trick that's necessary to avoid people just looking at the, the reality of it, right? Like it is creative, but it is also repetitive. Um, and, and you can't really square those two things unless you say the product is worth much more than we've been charging. So let's charge more and then we'll pay more, which is part of what's happening right now anyways. In, you have a, a reference that you kind of touch on and this is talking about working for, um, you know, high temper, high um, strung, we'll call it chefs. You're, you're referencing um, um, what is uh, the, the chef of the restaurant at Meadowood. And you share, quote, you'll find people in these kitchens who will say that they were treated and paid horribly, illegally even. There are just as many who will say that the harsh conditions turned them into who they are today, for which they are grateful. And then you share that you could say the same. And uh, I'm not quite saying this quote as like a gotcha to you, but because it's something that I <laughs> grapple with, too, because, you know, of, uh, of course, the forge that was my restaurant experience made me a really hardened and skilled professional. But would I drop 
anyone into a single day of my nine years of restaurant experience? Probably not, because it's only now, after coming on the, down the other side of the mountain, that I can look back with any positive sentiment. But is there a, like, are we getting to a level of progress where there is challenging moments to overcome and real skill development that can be possible to make sure that we have people that are operating at a really high level without any sort of these things that you touch on with harsh conditions or low pay or anything like that? Well, now I know how Sarah Palin feels with that gotcha question. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, you know, you got to I, yourself. I mean, I I'm you... just bringing it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was much like the way you phrased it. it for yourself in the book, I was trying to be honest about like, hey, there are two sides to this coin. I don't just want to say staging is a totally unacceptable practice. I would never do it. I don't support it. On the other hand, I'm like, I, I've done it. I, I would do it if I had the opportunity to do it today in some way. It's obviously I'm not going to abandon my wife and child so I can go work for two months in Spain. Um, so, so one is two things can be true at the same time, right? Like something being contradictory doesn't make it untrue. I heard a good, uh, uh, a good, a good sort of storytelling uh, uh, guideline one time. A good story turns against the way it drives. You know, that's part of what grabs our attention. And sometimes those, sometimes those contradictions are what tells us like there's meat on the bone. Like this is worth investigating because it's not black and white um, a, a situation can be exploitative and also benefit you in the long run uh, but to answer your actual question like is is there some way to make that more equitable i think that's a that's a key question and you know the direction i go and maybe this makes me unpopular is uh, simplify the menu um, I, I think menus are too long they're too complicated I think we have, uh, the dining class has grown accustomed to a level of luxury, both in uh, cooking uh, and presentation and service that has only ever truly been achievable through taking advantage of the people making and serving the food. And the alternative to that doesn't have to be everyone, you know, making a pot of soup on Sunday and eating the same gruel all week um, or drinking um, uh, Soylent, uh, I think there is a slightly stripped down version of a contemporary restaurant that can complement both desires, you know, both our desire to go out to feel all the feelings we feel in a restaurant, right? To be satiated, to have something new, to be delighted, to be a little bit pampered by service, uh, to get together with friends, to be flattered by by lighting and music and all these things, uh, while at the same time take care of employees and and I think this is the real key: not give them more work to do than is possible or reasonable in the time they have to do it. And and as one chef owner put it to me, you know, part of the way to do that is to take your 30-item menu and cut it down to 16, right? And outsource some of those things that you have been too prideful to admit that you don't need to make yourself. You know, you don't need to make your own pickles and bread and butter. You don't, you know, things that result in you having to tell staff, well, if you got to come in two hours early to do it, you know, you just do what you got to do. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to get you up to speed. You know, it's the thing the chef says. I just, I just want to give you more to do in a day than you can do right now. So in six months, you're going to be ready for that promotion, right? Because you're going to be tougher and stronger and everything. Instead, I, you know, I think the alternative is to have the, the smaller, more compact menu that people can actually execute in a reasonable amount of time, which, again, is something we're seeing right now. You know, we started seeing it uh, where I lived for the first uh, 45 years of my life in Ontario. Uh, when there was, we started to see this a few years ago when there was a minimum wage increase, and it was sizable enough that a lot of restaurants started saying, like, I, if I'm going to pay more for each hour of labor, I think I need to have fewer hours of labor. So why don't I give people a little less to do? How can I do that? Why don't I cut down my menu a little more? It's a challenge to the, and another attitude 
that is part of the customer is always right, which is that there's something for everybody on every menu. Um, but I think that's that's a reachable challenge, you know. I mean, I think there absolutely should be something for most of us, like whether like when it comes to food restrictions, accommodating people. But the point at which your menu is, you know, 200 items to make sure that everybody has something. And as a result, everyone's running around like chickens with their heads cut off to produce it. Uh, it's unsustainable. What you're effectively advocating for, and this is kind of my last question before we get into some some rapid fire ones, in Seth Godin's words, is changing culture, and that's really hard, right? But but you lay out the example that we used to have smoking and non smoking sections in restaurants. That was just part of the culture. Even in hospitals, you you were able to smoke in hospitals or planes, and that's within recent memory, right? So we can all see that culture has changed in a relatively short time frame. So. I wanted mm-hmm. to know what you think is valuable or some potential resources that you've seen as great examples to keep in mind when one is thinking about changing culture. Great resources to keep in mind when you're thinking about changing culture. I don't think I have a quick answer to that question uh, or, or, or a pithy answer. I can only say that it's achievable. I think the example of smoking is one that, you know, we experienced in in our lifetimes. And I reach for that one because I'm old enough to remember when it seemed inconceivable. And when, you know, so many restaurateurs fought back against that, wherever you are in Canada or the United States, and those, rest, you know, and, and they were aided by the tobacco organization who had a financial interest against that change. And it's not dissimilar now. You know, you've got the, uh, the NRA, aka the other NRA or Restaurants Canada, these lobbying organizations that have always fought against the minimum wage um, for their own reasons. Um, but it's changing despite that. Uh, I mean, I think part of what I advocate for in the book is just thinking about these things and having conversations with friends uh, and changing our own personal behavior. But wherever you are, there are grassroots organizations trying to change things uh, for other people. Uh, and sometimes that's specifically a, uh, a labor movement, you know, uh, some a non-union organization or a union organization that's looking to organize workers. And sometimes it's just like a workplace that is changing the dynamic, right? A restaurant that's saying we're going to eliminate tipping or we're going to you know, one of the examples that really inspired me from the book is uh, Juliet and Peregrine in Boston, or just outside Boston, where in addition to a, a profit sharing with staff model, they they use an open book management system where, um, you know, in a typical chef-driven restaurant, so you'd have staff meetings for wine, right, to make sure everybody knows the hell out of the wine so that they can sell the wine. I mean, that's the purpose, right? But it's all sort of... Um, it's very often framed in a sort of educational capacity, but you're not interested in like developing these great, the, the wine knowledge of the staff. You want them to be able to sell your expensive wine. And in the open book management system, it's about um, having meetings about how the business is run to train people to run a business and teaching them skills that carry them well beyond the positions where they are and the earnings that they have. Uh, so when you find these kinds of businesses, you know, I think that is uh, hand in hand with the sort of supporting some grassroots labor organization and saying, I'm, I, I want to give these people my money. I want to like find the kind of restaurants I really believe in and devote my dining dollars to them, particularly when, you know, most of us have, whether we budget or not, X amount of dollars that we spend eating out and a lot of people and what I use this phrase a lot, the dining class. I, I think you know what I mean by that, but people who like to eat out a lot and who can afford to eat out a lot, we're very fortunate in that regard. And often that dining class is led by the list, the top 10 lists and the top, you know, which are always, they're never framed in this way, but they're often the top 10 expensive restaurants. They're the top 10 restaurants that also have a, a, a big publicity, uh, budget and or company working for them. So just, you know, the, the old Simpsons uh, uh, advice of just don't look, um, just ignoring that circus is like the first step 
And then the second is, okay, so if I just like don't allocate my dining dollars to this sort of top 10 list restaurant world, well, then I can really focus on like, hey, that restaurant that eliminated tipping or this like family that I got to know who makes this amazing Cambodian food or whatever the issue is you, you want to support, um, saying like, why don't, if we eat out twice a week or we order in twice a week, why wouldn't I keep going back to those people and trying to like cross off my list, this scavenger hunt style dining and say, well, I've eaten there and I've eaten there. Yeah, this was okay. That was all right. Like, why not moneyball it and say, instead of playing the spread and trying to like have something from everybody, why don't you like, why don't I go for like the guaranteed wins? I know this place made us a great meal when we came in. It was a fantastic dining experience. Why wouldn't I go back? there. I think I've been kind of singing that song for the last five years. Who wouldn't rather go uh, back to a restaurant they already knew was great than a new restaurant, uh, considering the odds of having a good meal at a new restaurant? 